Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to uh, see you here today on this little chilly but sunny Sunday. So uh, great to have you all back with us. And today we're going to be continuing our discussion looking at a Christian guide through anxiety and depression. Today we're going to shift gears a little bit. Last week was a little more technical. Uh, I threw a lot at you, um, which will probably be true today, too. But uh, we're going to be looking more now into how we can kind of really manage our thoughts and look into some of the cognitive elements of depression. Uh, and so I'll try to interweave some biblical principles with some uh, hopefully practical things that you can implement that should hopefully help. Um, and so if you recall, uh, our course objective uh, is kind of summarized here. There's a lot in this statement, but it kind of captures what we've been looking at. First of all, we're, we're looking to provide a Christian perspective on these issues, both the physical, the psychological, and the spiritual issues of anxiety and depression, and offer both some practical steps as well as some biblical insights of how God can take our situation and transform that so that we can experience uh, and reflect His glory in a lost and broken world. So. Uh, the topics that we've been going through are kind of listed in your outline. So we're now in week four, uh, transitioning again, focusing on some of the more of the mental issues, the way we look, think about things, our beliefs, our perspectives, um, and also more importantly, our thought life. So we're going to look at that in detail today. And so before we do that, though, let's go ahead and uh, open with a word of prayer. <clears throat> so dear God, just thank you for this day. Thank you for... Uh, just the crisp weather, Lord, uh, where we can feel alive and uh, just bless our time together as we look at what your word has to say about how to uh, manage our thoughts. And the uh, Lord, help this just be a fruitful time for us, Lord, uh, not only today, but as we continue to meditate on the truth of your word through this week. God, just uh, be with each person here that might be struggling with anxiety or depression. Uh, Lord, just help them to uh, sense your spirit. In a real way, Lord, this morning and also this week, we ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so last week I, I tried to give you sort of a, a detailed, what I call sort of a cascade. You might think of this as a series of dominoes that kind of fall uh, as we start to encounter stresses in our lives. And these can get out of control and then um, basically present themselves as some type of anxiety or uh, depressive disorder that we talked about. Uh, the first week kind of gave an overview of what we meant by the topic. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked in detail about stress, different types of stresses in our lives, how they can trigger this cascade. And then last week, we spent some time looking at the biochemistry of our body, uh, hormones, neurotransmitters, and so on, how those things can get triggered. Uh, and we talked about how stress can trigger that, but also we, we alluded to <clears throat> somewhat last week that your body can also have problems that it can get out of whack uh, and be triggering these things. And sometimes uh, medications are, are useful to help uh, basically get that stabilized. And so we kind of differentiated what we mean by emotions and feelings. And uh, today we're really going to start looking at this cognitive element box there in great more uh, detail. And just to re by way of review, remember we kind of define emotions and feelings differently. Emotions are those things that we're experiencing that are uh, in our on our body. So there's a physical response that we're experiencing it has to do with our biochemistry. So this plays out in our body. And you might think of an emotion as a noun. Uh, it's something that's happening that we really have no control over. And we looked at that sort of biochemical cascade uh, last week. And uh, we, we saw that there's this trigger. Uh, there's different parts of our brain that get activated in response to stress. They dump chemicals in our body. We experience either anxiety over time. We can, we can feel depressed. And a lot of that's tied back to things that we have no control over, just the way our bodies have been created uh, to protect us from threats and things of that nature. The other element, though, is, is our prefrontal cortex, this is kind of the thinking part of our brain, and typically this doesn't kick in till later on, and this is really the source, ultimately, as we'll see, that starts causing uh, what we might call anxiety or depression issues, so that's what we want to look at in particular today. So 
We then differentiated feelings from emotions. Feeling is, is really a mental as opposed to a physical perception. Feelings play out in our mind as opposed to our brain. <clears throat> and we might think of a feeling as a verb as opposed to a noun. So if, by virtue of being a, ner a verb, that would imply there's something that we have control over, that we're doing, all right? So someone can depress themselves um, <clears throat> or we can worry about things. Those are things that we can do, but we want to see how we can actually separate that from our emotions, differentiate the two, and then start looking at practically how we can impl implement some things to do that. So again, today we're going to look at, at more detail this cognitive element, our thinking part of our, of our brain, <coughs> or, or of our mind. And this is a little more complicated. Uh, there's a lot of other pieces that kind of come to play here. We can we can step back and think about, we have life experiences that we've interpreted in the past that predispose us to certain things. Uh, we have certain memories that can be triggered by different types of, of stressors. Some of those memories may be accurate. Some of those may be inaccurate. We typically all tend to view things in the past maybe not perfectly accurately. So we may have memory issues that we're dealing with. Uh, and these all affect our perspectives, how we interpret different types of interactions uh, with people in relationships uh, and other situations can all affect how we're going to respond. We also have a belief system that tends to, again, predispose us to look at situations one way or the other. And so all of these can have important influences on the way that we interpret things. And so next week, we'll, we'll look at our perspectives and beliefs in a little more detail. Today, I want to focus on these last two boxes, what I'm calling involuntary thoughts and voluntary thoughts. And we want to see that there is a difference between those two, and it's very important that we learn how to separate uh, and understand the difference between those two. So biblically, in looking at how we can manage sort of our mental health, uh, a, a very probably familiar passage in 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the fact that we're engaged in this, this war, uh, with ourselves, even though we're walking as physical beings, we have a spiritual dimension. So we need to come up with strategies to address it that way. And he has really three pieces here that he lays out in this passage. Again, something we're all probably familiar with, where he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds, which is really talking about faith and acceptance. And we'll look at this the very last week. Uh, and then he goes on talking about we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, which really relates to our belief system and our perspectives. And so we'll look at that in more detail next week. But this week, we want to focus on the last part of that passage where he says, and take every thought captive to obey Christ. And what I'm going to propose to you is the way we do that is to implement something that I'm going to characterize or call Christian mindfulness. All right. So the term mindfulness is, is really a lot in the literature these days, certainly in modern psychology. Uh, so as a Christian, how, what should our perspective be on that? Uh, there's some negative connotations perhaps with that, but I want to lay out what that really means and how the concept of mindfulness, as I'll define that in a Christian perspective, I think can be helpful for managing our thought life. Okay. So let's, let's kind of define what we mean by thoughts. I've defined emotions and feelings. I'm going to walk you through this because I've got some detailed statements here uh, that, that I want to emphasize. The first of these is that any given moment, we are consciously aware of the thoughts that are appearing in our mind. Would you all agree with that? Okay. Uh, however, upon closer inspection, we will see that our thoughts actually consist of two different types. You may not have thought of this in the past, but I want you to think about that. First, we have what I call involuntary thoughts. Okay, These are thoughts that originate in our mind. They come from either our brain or something I'll call our conscience. The Bible talks about we have something called a conscience, and I'll talk a little more about that. But if, if I'm in a situation, I'm having thoughts that start popping into my conscious mind, some of those are coming from our brain. Okay? We have no control over those. They're just popping into our heads. We also have other thoughts that may be coming into our consciousness from our conscience. Okay, Those are involuntary. We have no control over those. 
Uh, then we have what I would call voluntary thoughts. These are thoughts that we build in our mind through the action of our will. We have a will and we can construct thoughts. We can focus our mind on things and develop thoughts. Okay, does that make sense to everyone? All right, so we have these two, and this is an important point that I want to make. One of the biggest causes of anxiety and depression arises from the inability of people to distinguish between our voluntary and our involuntary thoughts. Okay, very important. Uh, so let's talk first about our involuntary thoughts. Our brains are constantly generating thoughts. Our brain is constantly looking for threats. It's interpreting things, and it's generating thoughts and sending those thoughts to our conscious mind. Okay, it's trying to to protect us, so it's always sending these like red alerts and, and thoughts. And psychologists have looked at the, the type of involuntary thoughts of people, and what they've discovered is about 80% of your involuntary thoughts are negative. Okay, uh, Why is that? Uh, because God has designed our brains to protect us from things, so we have this defense mechanism. So we're always evaluating, scanning the situation to look for problems. And if we think there's a problem, our brain is sending us a message. It's like, hey, there's something to look for here. You better take a look at this to our conscious mind. So then our conscious mind can start looking and evaluating that's, whether that's a threat or not and make a decision whether to do something. All right. However, our brains are also very creative. Thus, it is always, that is, our brain is always generating sometimes very bizarre and disturbing thoughts. Would everybody agree you occasionally have some very bizarre and disturbing thoughts? Anybody have those? So am, I, am I the only one? Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is something I th it's very important you have to understand. These, these crazy thoughts are not coming from you. They're coming from your brain. Now, you might think, well, I am a brain. No, you're not your brain, okay? Just like you're physically not your spleen or something. Yes, that's part of you, but that's not who you are. That's not your person. So your brain is generating all these kind of weird thoughts. They're not coming from us, and they, they really say nothing about you at all. Okay? So we may have some crazy thought, and we say, oh, that's terrible, I'm thinking this. That's nothing to do, it's just your brain is generating this, this goofy thought or crazy thought or a really horrible thought. That's your brain, it's not you. There's not a moral correlation to you and that thought that you're having, okay? Do you understand that? It's very important. So, you know, it's not saying that I'm a bad or crazy person for having that thought. They're just things that are coming from my brain. Yes, Keith? You have some an emotional response to that? Yeah, you have a thought about it and maybe even a response and maybe even anxiety over a time, you know, it's an environmental Sure. Thing. Is that coming directly from the brain? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's triggering thoughts. I mean, you, you, we remember things not just cognitively. We also remember them uh, through our five senses, and those get locked in your brain. So you can, I'm sure we've all had experience, you have something triggers not only a memory, but there's almost a smell or a, you just remember something about that event, okay? That's coming from your brain, okay? There's a physiological connection. And sometimes if we're, um, and we have a thought, like if we're memory or something, and even though we're usually not angry about it, it starts to make us angry and it starts to make us think, oh, well, I would say this, this, and that. Absolutely. We can have memories that can trigger this whole cascade I just talked about, right? And it fires the, Absolutely. Okay. So a problem arises when we start believing that these thoughts are us. Okay. It's one of the people, people that struggle with OCD like I do. You, you start thinking that your thoughts are yourself, and so you, that disturbs you. You try to get away from your thoughts, and the more you do that, the more they just keep coming back. Okay. Uh, why is that? So our brain interprets our reaction to these thoughts meaning that they must be important. So if I get emotionally upset about a thought I'm having, your brain said, oh, this is important because you're getting upset. I need to keep pushing this thought into your conscious mind till you figure out the solution to it, okay? It's just the way our brains work. 
So it will increase these thoughts in frequency and intensity, and intensity until we resolve the, the, what we think is the problem associated with the thought. The problem is there's not a problem. It's just a crazy thought you're having. You don't need to be trying to solve a crazy thought that you're having because that's just your brain. There's, nothing, there's not really a problem. So we start trying to solve this imaginary problem. And then the fact we can't solve the problem just makes it keep getting worse and worse. Yes, sir. Yes. It, yeah, absolutely. It just starts, you, just car, you keep recycling, recycling. The more you do it, it just keeps getting out of control, right? That's exactly what I'm talking about, okay? Um, all right, so, but what happens when we can't resolve the imaginary problem of having crazy thoughts? Our brain just keeps recycling the thoughts over and over again until we find ourselves trapped in this endless loop. Anybody ever felt, had that happen to them? Okay. Uh, what does that feel like? It's exhausting. it's exhausting, okay? This is the best analogy I've had because this is what it felt like to me. It's like being trapped in a hall of mirrors. You can every, route every route is a dead end. You keep trying to solve this. You keep running into a dead end. You can see through the... It looks like this is the way out. You, you just go that direction, you run into it, all right? And it's like you can see everybody else. You're kind of communicating to people, but you're really not there. You can't really get in touch with them. Okay, it's an extremely frustrating experience and that can drive you to very severe depression because you feel like you're trapped inside a hall of mirrors and you can't get out. So if you're dealing with a loved one that's struggling with anxiety, recognize that's what it's feeling like to them. Okay, uh, they feel like they're trapped, they can't get out and no one, they can see people, they can talk, but then no one understands that they're trapped and what they're feeling like and that's what it feels like. Okay. All right, so the other type of involuntary thoughts we can have in our brain is our conscience. The Bible talks about that God's put something in us, a message. If you go and look at Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about this, this idea of a conscience uh, that's a witness or a testimony to us. Uh, but over time, just like other parts of ourselves, our conscience can also get damaged or broken. Okay, Paul talks about your, your conscience can be seared. Okay, so your conscience can get out of whack. Uh, and over time, your conscience, if it gets seared, it can start justifying sinful behavior on one end. On the other end, it can start condemning you for things that aren't sinful. Okay, and you have these two, like, you're going down a road and you can start to get into one ditch or the other. Okay, so Paul talks about this. In Scripture, and he talks about the, the libertines and the Judaizers, the two different groups that kind of get hooked up into this mental thought. So one of the problems you can have with a conscience is it can start judging you. It starts turning on you and constantly judging everything that you do. Does so everybody deal with guilt, for example? Your conscience is like over-exercise, and it's just constantly beating you up, okay? Uh, now, a conscience can be good, but it can also get out of control. And so ultimately, in either case, we always have to evaluate any thought that pops into our head how. We have to look at what does Scripture say about this. We have to rely on the, the leadership of the Holy Spirit to understand the truth of what we're thinking. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. So, if we go back then and look at 2 Corinthians 4, 5, there's this command to take every thought captive to obey Christ. Now, this is, this is one of the most misapplied verses in the Bible I've ever seen. What, what a, lot, a lot of people, maybe what do you think about, what does this mean, to take every thought captive? What, what is Paul saying here? What are some common interpretations? I'm sure people have heard these. Okay, that can be a problem, absolutely. What this is not meaning is trying to push all those thoughts out of your head. A lot of times we think taking thoughts captive, if you have this quote-unquote bad thought that pops in your head, you need to push that out of your, your consciousness. 
that would be a good thing. The problem is the way your brains are created, if you try to push things out of your consciousness, it just strengthens that thought and it makes it come back even stronger. Okay? Now, relative to voluntary and involuntary thoughts, what is Paul talking about here? What kind of thoughts do you think he's talking to? Is he talking about voluntary or involuntary thoughts? Any? Okay. All right, we think it's voluntary. Let me, let me give you my argument why I think it's involuntary. Okay. Voluntary thoughts are things that are being built by our will. Right? So if we're gonna if we're gonna take our voluntary thoughts captive, the issue is really not our thoughts; it's our will. We have to we have to work. We have to take one step back to deal with voluntary thoughts because we're building those. We're, we're exercising our will. So if we're gonna take those thoughts captive, the, the the solution is don't build them in the first place. Does that make sense? So what I would argue, Paul is really talking about here is involuntary thoughts because we have no control over involuntary thoughts. Those are the thoughts that are coming into our minds without our permission, so to speak, and that's something that's alien that then we're being told to take captive. Does, does everybody follow my logic there? Okay. So if we're going to take our involuntary thoughts captive, then we need to somehow be what? I, I can't take something captive unless I'm separate from it. Would you agree with that? In order to take it captive, I've got to be removed or at least a step away from that. If I am my involuntary thoughts, how can I keep myself? I have to be able to separate myself to take something captive. Does that, does that make sense logically? Okay. So we need to separate ourselves uh, and, then, and then exercise our will and then use our voluntary thoughts to take our involuntary thoughts captive. That makes sense. Okay. A little tricky. So in order to do this, we first have to really have a, a biblical perspective of who we are and how we've been created. And so I'm going to use a series of metaphors uh, to hopefully give you some pictures in your mind that you can kind of visualize what's going on here because these can be very helpful as you try to go through this exercise of separating from your thoughts. All right, so the one I'm going to use, and if, if you were with me uh, last year, I introduced this concept of three cheers to kind of describe sort of our, our mental context. So I want, to think, I want you to think about your mind as having three different chairs in it. Okay, so one chair is, is our brain or our body. This is generating these involuntary thoughts. We have our soul, which is really kind of our, our seat for ourselves. We have an active self. This is where we generate voluntary thoughts. Our will is operating. And then we also have a conscience that can be influenced by the Holy Spirit uh, to, to speak to us. Uh, but then, in addition to context, which is these three chairs, we also have content. That is, each of these chairs have things that reside in them. All right, so as an example, for the, the brain, the brain has sinful desires, it has uncomfortable emotions, painful memories, and imaginary thoughts are all coming out of this chair. Okay, and again, this is an analogy or a metaphor. Right? So just remember that. So in our soul, our, our active self, we have perspectives, beliefs, strategies, and voluntary thoughts. In our conscience, we have all these norms, some of which can be good, some of which can be bad. Would, would, you, rec would you all agree that when we evaluate situations, we tend to evaluate systems for, through filters of sort of a norms that we have? What is normative here? Is this good or bad based on, and where, where do we get those norms from? Obviously, we should be getting them from God's word, but we pick up a lot of social norms, other types of norms. We all, we all have our own personal norms, okay? Not, not that I agree with this characterization, but you hear people talk about, well, that's my truth, okay? They have built their own structural norm that they're using. So we all evaluate things from our own norms as well, Okay? So we have both a context and we have a both a content. But my argument is going to be, that is not you. All that stuff is not you. We, we tend to think it is, but it is not us. Because the Bible talks about there's something else that constitutes who we are, and it uses some language like something called our inner being. 
or some inner self or inner being. So in Proverbs, it talks about the human spirit is the lamp of the Lord that sheds light on one's most innermost being. For the inward heart and mind of, of a man are deep. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. I keep talking about there's something that who are, it's to our true self. All right. So again, this is, this is a metaphor I'm using. So there's this inner self or inner being. That's who we really are. And so by way of an analogy, I want you to think about if that's the case, then at any particular time, my true self can be moving in and out of these different chairs. Okay? At some time, uh, if I'm, I'm like judging myself, I can be sitting over here. Or if I'm, I'm just kind of mulling over some hurt I've had from emotions in the past or memories, I can be sitting in this chair. If I'm just ruminating on that, or if I'm making some active choices and decisions, I can be sitting in this chair, okay? So hopefully I'll give you a perspective. My point is, when you're struggling with anxiety and depression and thoughts and things like that, recognize those are not you. Those are things you're experiencing. This is you here. All this other stuff are like furniture in the room that's, that's sort of in your, yourself that you can move around in. Okay. All right, so to, to kind of reinforce that, let me take a real quick exercise. I've done this before, uh, if you've been with me, but I want everyone to take just, we'll take one minute or 30 seconds. I want everyone to close your eyes and just, just focus on your breathing and don't think about anything else. Okay, just, just focus on your breathing. So don't, don't think about anything. Okay, so how many, that was weird doing that. Anybody that thought that was a little weird? Okay. Uh, did anyone have any thoughts come into your head? Okay. <laughs> so now let's think about this. So your active will is focusing on your breathing. That's who you, that's yourself is doing that. And then there's these thoughts that just popped into your head. Did you do that or did, did they just pop into your head involuntarily? That you had no control over that, right? So, so you're sitting in this chair, and these, these thoughts from your brain just start popping into your conscious mind, okay? You had no control over those thoughts. They just appeared. Now, most of the time we go through life, we never differentiate that. We don't even think about it. We're having thoughts coming in and out of our consciousness. We just assume that they're us, okay? Because that's just how we, we, we don't even differentiate the fact that these are, are different, and so my point is, a lot of our problems with anxiety and depression come about again by the fact that we're listening to these voices and we're, we're treating them like they're important uh, or that they're true, and then we're reacting emotionally to them, either getting anxious about that or we tend to start mulling over things and we start getting depressed about that. They have, even though they're not true, they can still trigger and have an impact on our emotions that can start this whole anxiety, depression cascade again, okay? All right, so now in order for us to be able, by way of my metaphor, to see these three chairs and evaluate the content of those chairs, somehow we need to be able to separate ourselves from those and get a new perspective. If I'm gonna capture something, I have to be separate from that, okay? So again, using this metaphor of these chairs, I want to introduce then a third, or another concept, and this is a concept of the observing chair or the observing mind, okay? So we have the capacity mentally to stop and separate our mind and evaluate and look at what we're thinking about that. About. Has anybody ever done that? I'm sure we've done that. You just don't think about it. Ever stop down, 
calm down your, your emotion, you, you stop and you kind of step back and you look at what, what was I just thinking? What are these thoughts that are going through me? You're, you're evaluating them, okay? So what you've done is you've actually moved your, your conscious mind from the active mind over to this observing mind. We all have the capacity to do that, okay? So the observing mind is not reacting, it's not generating voluntary thoughts, it's just observing, okay? And so the way that we do that, the way that we move from one of these chairs over to this chair is to do something called mindfulness. All that means is we are becoming mindful or aware of what we're thinking or, or we're mindfully thinking about what chair was I just sitting in when I had that thought, okay? What was the content that was going through my mind when that was happening, when I was sitting in that chair? So we... we God has created us with the ability to be able to evaluate that, okay? I think part of, the, part of the fall was this all got mangled up, our capacity to do these things, and now we're kind of caught into some of this mangled machinery that's a result of the fall, okay? All right, so did everyone pick up one of these black spots? So I'm trying to give you some, again, metaphors or analogies. Again, if you've been with me uh, before, I've used this analogy uh, so you can either get a black dot, or if you're having anxiety problems, maybe you want to try a red dot, okay? So, uh, so what I want you to do is to put your, look at this, put your nose right up in the middle of the circle, okay? All right, now as you do that, what, what can you see? Or what do you see? You just see, you just see black, right? Or maybe the, the peripheral? Now, slowly move that dot away from your nose. What do you notice happens? Okay. The dot becomes more clear. What else do you notice? You can notice everything else. Okay. Uh, a lot of things. So mindfulness is like doing that. It's like when you are in the throes of anxiety or depression, you're stuck in one of those chairs, probably the, the brain chair, and that's all you can see, okay? So mindfulness en enables you to push that back away so you can finally get a perspective, not only of what's going on, but also that your anxiety is not all-consuming. That's, that's everything there is. It's just a piece out there, okay? Does that make sense? So that's, that's something, if you ever realize having a panic attack or something like that, you can do this to kind of give you a perspective. Hey, this is... My panic is not everything. It's just something that I'm experiencing, okay? It's not me. It's something that I'm experiencing. Okay, so here's another analogy for you computer folks. So instead of chairs, you might think of our brain. We've got these three computer screens. We have our brain screen. It's saying all kinds of things to us. You're going crazy. They're going to take you away. It's just throwing all these messages up there. Uh, you've got your conscience. You must have done something bad to be experiencing this. So these messages are popping up. We have our active mind. We have a keyboard. We can actually type in things. Okay. These other things are just generating messages. So relative to the observing mind, you've got this fourth, fourth computer. Everybody, anyone have an Apple computer? Ever get one of these things? Yeah, the spinning beach ball of death. What, what does that normally mean? Something bad's going on. Your, your computer's locked up. Okay. You Dell folks, you know, just, just the whole get the blue screen or something like that. Okay. All right. So what happens when, you, when that happens? With, what do you normally have to do? You have to reboot the computer, right? So mindfulness, okay, is like rebooting your mind. It's because it, you're just, it's all overwhelming now. You're kind of, you can't sort things. And it's just, you're just spinning in this wheel. You can't get out. So you need to step back, reboot your mind. All right. So you can see, okay, what's going on here? So I can start over and start moving forward. Okay. Does, it, does that make sense? Okay. So hopefully that's another metaphor that might be useful. So let me give you a definition. I've used this term mindfulness. What, what do I mean by that? So I'm going to give you a definition of Christian mindfulness has four pieces to it. 
First, mindfulness is being purposefully aware. So we're being aware, but we're not just randomly, but we are purposefully being aware. We are making a conscious choice to be aware of something. So uh, I just had you all stop and start focusing on your breathing. I, I, I was making a conscious, focused choice to be aware of my breathing. Okay. And I want to be, a, and in this case, I want to be aware of what? My present mental state. The word present is very important. We'll talk more about this next week. But I want to be aware of my, what's going on right now. Not what's going on tomorrow. Not what happened last week that I'm worried about. Just focus on right now what's, what's happening. So I'm going to be consciously, purposefully aware of my present mental state. What I want to be aware of my mental state. Both the context and by way of analogy or metaphor, I use those three chairs. So you're going to think, okay, which chair am I sitting in? Or was I just sitting in? And you also want to be aware of the content. What was, what was I thinking? What was I feeling? So you want to separate from your feelings and your thoughts, and you want to just observe those non-critically or non-judgmentally. You're saying, what was, what was I thinking here? What thoughts were going through my mind? I'm just observing. That's separating me. That's helping me to reboot my mind. Now, this is typically what a secular definition of of mindfulness would entail. So from a Christian perspective, we want to do more than just separate. We want to get refocused on the Holy Spirit and truth so we can reactivate our, our cells and then act positively to start the process in a, in, a, in a positive way. So we want to do that while resting in God's presence and also acting on the truth. So we want to step away, reboot. We want to reorient ourselves to the Holy Spirit, then we want to listen and then act on the truth to go forward. And we, then we want to re-engage our active mind to communicate truth to our conscience and our involuntary thoughts or involuntary mind, and then we want to act on God's truth and go forward. Okay? Now, it's easier said than done, and we'll spend the next two uh, sessions together breaking that out, but that's what we want to do. So, in addition then to using this observing mind as a way to separate, this is also, I'd like to argue, is the state of our consciousness where we can now start to refocus back on, on the Holy Spirit. So besides being able to separate from our thoughts, the observing mind provides a chair we can experience true intimacy through Christ through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. However, in this case, we're not using the chair to see what is in front of us, we're now going to use the chair to see what's above us, or I'll use that, that analogy. We want to see the spiritual domain, or we want to now get back in contact with the Holy Spirit. Because if I'm sitting in the, the brain chair and I'm getting overwhelmed with these thoughts, I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit, am I? Okay. So I need to separate from my brain, get first observe what's going on, and then reorient my focus to the Holy Spirit. Okay. So I want to argue, uh, and you may take argument with my exergesis, but I really think this is what Jesus is getting at in Matthew 11, 28 through 29. He says, come to me. Where is Jesus? I'm going to argue that Jesus is in the observing chair. Okay? We need to come to Jesus. All you labor and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke, get, get away, get my perspective on reality, not your perspective, because your perspective is totally distorted. You've got to separate to where I am, get my perspective. How do we get that? Through, through God's word, through the instrumentality of the Holy Spirit to get truth on my situation so that I can then re-engage in that, all right? He says, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest in your souls. I will argue, especially if you're dealing with anxiety and depression, you're not going to find rest in one of those other three chairs. You're, that's where all the turmoil is going on. Okay, So we have to pull away and get a godly perspective. Why do I believe this is what Jesus is talking about? How did Jesus know what to do? In John, he, Jesus gives a really fantastic insight on how he knew what to do at any particular time in his ministry. You might remember. Okay, let's look at, let's look at, let's, what, what did Jesus say? He says, so Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, 
but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he is doing, and greater works than these he will show him, so that you may all marvel. So I'm going to argue that Jesus was constantly in the observing chair, interacting with his active self, because he was constantly observing what the Father was doing. Not only was he observing everything else, Scripture says in John, Jesus knew all men's thoughts. He was always observing, all right? But he also was observing what the Father was always doing. That's how he knew what to do, all right? What did Jesus say we can do on our own? When we're sitting in the green or the, the red or the blue chair, what can we do on our own? Nothing. What he say is the key to the Christian life? We have to what? Starts with an A. We have to abide. We have to abide in him. Okay. All right. We have to separate and abide in him. Okay. So what does that look like practically? So we can separate in the observing chair. And again, these are metaphors I'm using. You can see what's in front of you, but more importantly, now you're connected to, to Christ, the source of truth. The Holy Spirit can speak truth to us in that state, which can then dispense all right, into our minds to address those disturbing thoughts or the judgmental thoughts we're having and so on. Okay. Now, there's a lot of material I'd like to get you, Dave. It's impossible. So I, there's a bunch of essays I sent you. All right. One of these talks about how do I know if what I'm hearing, all right, is really God speaking to me, all right? So I, I sent you a whole essay by Dallas Willard, uh, a, a Christian philosopher and also a Baptist minister who talks about how, do you, how you can discern whether the, the voice or the thought that's in your mind is coming from God, okay? So I, I've given you some very practical advice on how to do that. There's also a little handout that you may have picked out talks about how to have proper perspective on your situation. Because if I'm sitting in my red chair or my green chair, my perspective is totally wrong. And I have to be able to step back and get God's perspective on the situation, be able to understand what's happening. Next week, we'll look at that in a lot more detail, okay, just by way of preview. So those are two excellent essays I've given you. So as we rest on the Holy Spirit, we listen for his voice to our inner self in the context of our circumstances as mediated through his word. And again, I'll, I'll flesh that out in more detail next week. We then act on that truth by using our active mind and speak truth to our involuntary mind and thoughts by using our will to then respond in obedience. Okay? Uh, let me give you an example. This is how Jesus did this. Remember when he was uh, facing temptation with Satan. How is, what would his response be? He was always in contact with the Father. He has truth. He speaks truth to the thoughts, or, or in this case, the verbalization that Satan was giving him that was attacking him. Okay? And I would argue that Jesus has given us a, a model for our, ourself when we're dealing with those involuntary thoughts and things like that. Okay? Now, this, is ra now this raises a very interesting question theologically. Uh, can Satan... Read our thoughts, or can he speak thoughts into our mind? Okay. Now, I think most people would answer the second question. You may not be sure about the first. Most people answer the question, second question, how, do you think? Yes, I think most of us have been brought up to think about that Satan can speak into our heads. Okay. I'm going to take an argument that you might find a little different, but I'm going to argue that I, I don't think that's probably true, okay? Uh, and I don't have time to go into that, but I've sent you a 30-page exegesis of the Scripture that, that addresses that specific question, actually both of those questions, all right? Uh, just real quickly, first of all, we have to recognize Satan is not omniscient, and he's not omnipresent, Okay? We have uh, several billion people in the world, and if Satan is speaking into your thoughts, all right, he's, I'm not, he's not omnipotent either, okay? He's a person. There's no record in Scripture where Satan ever spoke into someone's head, okay? When, it, when he tempted Jesus, he appeared physically and was speaking to him, okay? Uh, so I, I, it's probably intrigued you, so I, I've given you that 
Essie to go back and read. What I would argue is we have enough problems with our, our sinful flesh that's generating enough thoughts that's keeping us busy, all right? Uh, now, there, I, I definitely believe that we are in spiritual warfare, that we are dealing with spiritual attacks and so on, but I would argue that Satan cannot necessarily speak thoughts into our, our conscious mind, okay? Now, to some regard, it's somewhat irrelevant because the way that we're going to respond to that is going to be the same regardless, okay? But just as a sidebar theolo theological question, uh, I'll let you read through that essay, and you can come back, and, and uh, we can debate that next week if you want to. Okay. Yes, John? Uh, well, yeah, I would, I would make the same thing think with the arguments for the day. I, I believe that they use indirect and implicit and passive ways to influence us as opposed to directly attacking us that way. And that's not to say they can't attack us. I just don't think they can speak into our thoughts. Okay. All right, so you can, you can think about that one. All right, so I love this quote by Dr. Martin Lone Jones. Uh, he says, The main trouble in this whole matter of anxiety and spiritual depression, in a sense, is that we're allowing ourselves to talk to us instead of talking to ourselves. Am, am I trying to be deliberately paradoxical? Far from it. This is the very essence of wisdom in this manner. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You have not originated them, but they start talking to you. They bring back the problems of yesterday, etc. Someone is talking to you. Who is talking to you? Your brain is talking to you. Okay? So, so one of the strategies we have to recognize, these thoughts are kind of mind. We don't need to listen to them. They're just nonsense, but we can speak back to them, okay? Uh, now, there's a, little, there's a little pitfall there. I'll, I'll mention in a second, but first one should take th thought about that. So if we go back and look at this passage then, this, this passage we've been looking at has three parts. We're going to focus on the latter part today, and the next two weeks we'll focus on the other two parts. So we want to focus about taking every thought to, to make it captive to obey Christ. How are we going to do it? So I'm going to argue there's a sort of a five-step process. First, we need to separate from our thoughts. We've kind of talked about that. We need then to observe our thoughts. We need then to speak truth to our thoughts like we've just seen. We then need to defy your thoughts and act on the truth. That's what Jesus did. Okay, when tempted, he defied Satan. He spoke truth to it and he, and he went on. He acted on the truth. Then you need to learn to accept the discomfort and trust in God. And again, I'll talk a lot more about this discomfort concept and what that means to accept that uh, in two weeks. So how do we separate from our thoughts? There's several steps. One is to eliminate distractions. We're told to guard our hearts from everything else flows through it. David said, I will not set anything before my eyes that is worthless. Part of the reason we have all these crazy thoughts that are popping in our head is because of the junk we're watching and listening to during the week. That stuff does affect you. It's going into your brain, it's running around, and your brain's taking all that and it's building stuff from that. It's like throwing a bunch of, of Legos in your head and, the, and your brain starts constructing things and those things come back into your conscious mind. All right? Uh, it's, a, it's very important. We need to eliminate that type of distractive material that we're putting in our head. Uh, you need to learn to focus on the present. Most of our challenges, we, we spend a lot of our day thinking about tomorrow or thinking about yesterday. You ever think about how much of your brain you spend not really in the present, but thinking about something that's going to happen in the future or something that's happened in the past? Uh, so I've given you a fantastic essay by Blaise Pascal, uh, one of the most profound things I've ever read on this topic. Uh, and he goes through this whole essay, the, the dynamic of, of focusing on the present, why that's important. I mean, Jesus talked about this, right? He said, look at the birds of the air, consider the lilies of the field, not only for their spiritual context, but the fact those were things in front of you. You need to get your mind focused on the present. Right? He says, don't worry about the things of tomorrow. You need to just focus on today. This is a very important concept of learning as Christians to focus on the present. Where is Jesus at work right now? In the present, okay? 
Yes, he's Lord of the past, he's Lord of the future, but he's actively working right now in the present. If we're going to be working with him, we need to be focused where he is, okay? So another thing you can use is, I gave you the example of breathing. A lot of times if you're really stressed or you're, you feel your mind going on, just step away, focus on your breathing, and get recentered or refocused, okay? God has given us our breath as a way to do that, okay? Uh, par uh, uh, parenthetically, if you start practicing breathing like that, it really activates your vagus nerve, which will activate your parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system, which will automatically shut down some of the adrenaline and, and chemicals are being dumped in your head, okay? So we're told to be still. Uh, we're told that God has given us his breath, and we can use that to help us. Another thing we can do is use metaphors. I've already used several of these for you. Uh, these are other metaphors that help me when I'm trying to really kind of feel like my thoughts are taken over. Uh, and why do we use metaphors? Because Jesus used metaphors all the time. Can you think of some of the metaphors that Jesus used? I'll give you one to stimulate your brain. So uh, he is the potter, we are the clay. Okay. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. What's that? He's the bread of life. Okay. Okay. Why do you think Jesus used metaphors? Because they're pictures. They're things that are easier for us to, memor to memorize. We can always carry those around. They relate to things that we can, we can relate to. So he is the vine, we are the branches. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. He is the bridegroom, we are the bride. He is the treasure, we are jars of clay. There's all these metaphors in Scripture. Metaphors are very powerful, okay? Especially if you're dealing with mental issues like anxiety and depression. So here's a few of these. Think of your, think of your mind as a chessboard. So your thoughts are the chess pieces. All right, so you have your active pieces. You have these inactive or involuntary uh, pieces that are moving around. Your mind is the chess board, and then who are you? You're not, the, you're not the chess board. You're not the chess pieces. You're the chess player, right? So that gives you a way to kind of separate and understand the thoughts that you're having are not you. They're like pieces on a chess board, but you're really the player. Uh, think about a stage. You have actors that are your thoughts. The mind is the stage, and you're the director. Only in this case... You have a lot of crazy people that are running off uh, over the stage, apparently, occasionally, right? They're always messing up the play, okay? At least that's the way we think of it. We need to learn how to go ahead and direct the play, even though we have these crazy people running across the stage, okay? Uh, here's another metaphor, a school bus. Your thoughts are, the, are all the screaming kids on the, on the bus, okay? Uh, the bus is your mind, and you are the driver, can it be distracting to drive a, a what can be distracting to drive a car with a bunch of kids in the back going crazy? Okay, sure, but we can still focus, okay, and recognize that all those crazy people are are not us, uh, right? Uh, I, I've I've seen another metaphor I've seen another metaphor that uses monsters on the bus. I like I like kids better for for different reasons, <laughs> but anyway. Okay, so, so we need to then observe our thoughts. We've talked about separating those. Here are some verses that talk about how we need to think about our thoughts are deep. We need to draw them out. Here is one example I've used uh, repeatedly that's incredibly powerful. Uh, and this is in Romans 7, 14 through 25. And so my exegesis here is kind of extending this. Paul really talks about his actions. He says, the things I want to do, I can't do, right? He goes on. Uh, I'm, this is his conflict. Okay, so if our thoughts, uh, can we think of something as something that's occurring? I want, I want to take the, the word uh, action and replace it with thought, and I think it gives a new perspective on this dynamic that's going on in our mind, all right? So here, here really is an example of Paul practicing mindfulness, so he says, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh sold under sin. For I understand, I do not understand my own thoughts. Would you agree with that? Sometimes you don't understand your own thoughts. Okay. For I do not think what I want, but I think the very thing I hate. Now, if I, now if I think what I do not want, I agree with the law that that is good. What is he saying there is the fact that I'm able to make a judgment and think that's not a good thought is a good thing. 
that I have the capacity to do that. Okay. So it is no longer I who think it, but, but sin, that is my fallen brain or broken brain that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in my, my flesh, that is my brain is, I can't control that, it's just something that's my flesh. For I have the desire to think what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. That is, I have these thoughts that pop into my brain, I don't went there, and I, I don't have the ability to stop that. For I do not think the good I want, but the evil I do not want, that is what I keep thinking about. Now, if I think what I do not want, it is no longer I who does it, but sin that dwells in me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to think the right thing, evil thoughts lie close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being. So we go back to this inner being. So he's recognizing in my inner self, my true self, I really love God. I really want to uh, follow him. I want to have pure thoughts, but I have these crazy thoughts that I... They're coming in. I can't manage. But I see my, my flesh is my brain waging another law against the law of my mind and making me captive the law of sin that dwells in my flesh that is my brain. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? That's a perfect description of someone struggling with OCD, at least obsessive thoughts. Okay, It's like, this is horrible. I'm trapped. I can't control these thoughts. Who's going to deliver me? This is, this is a living hell. How am I going to get out of here? And so what does Paul say? He says, thanks be to God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then I myself serve the law of, of God with my mind. It is with my active thoughts, but with my involuntary thoughts, my brain, I'm serving the law of sin. Then he immediately goes on here because the chapter stops here. Sometimes we truncate that. We need to continue to read. I mean, remember the chapters were artificial divisions. The next verse in, in 8 1 says, There is therefore no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. Let me try to break this down for you. What Paul's saying here is, I have these horrible thoughts in my mind. I can't control those. I don't want those thoughts, but I keep having those thoughts. And my, my true self, I, I want to think positive things, but there's this conflict going on. I have no control. What am I going to do about it? And then he comes to the realization. I don't have to worry about those thoughts. They're going to be there. I just focus on my, my true self thinking, and I learn to accept the uncomfortable fact that I'm going to have those negative thoughts. And the guilt that would no, naturally come with that, those negative thoughts, he's able to counter by saying what? I'm in Christ now. There's no condemnation for those those horrible thoughts I'm having, because they're not me, first of all. But, but even if they are, they're now under the blood of Jesus, so I don't have to worry about those. So I, I can learn to coexist with these negative thoughts by ignoring them, focusing, though, on Christ and relying on the Holy Spirit to basically deal with that. And over time, as you do that, those thoughts will start to dissipate. That's just the way the brain is worked. The more you keep focusing on those, it's just going to keep those stirred up. It's like a glass of dirt. If you shake the jar up, all right, and you let it sit for a while, what happens? It'll settle out, okay? It's the same way with our minds. But the more you keep shaking it, it's just going to keep stirred up, okay? So hopefully that gives you a theological context where, where Paul was dealing with this. I personally think Paul had some, some mental afflictions. Uh, I know there's been speculation about what his thorn in the flesh is. A lot of people think it was eyes or physical. I think it was mental. I don't have time to go into that, but but anyway, yes. I think also like this, this false idol of productivity that you control the air you breathe. You, you never, it allows people to never take that step back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a good point. Yes, John. So, so if we act on those thoughts, is that just making it harder to prevent it? But well, by act, if you are if you are focusing your conscious, active mind on the, the the traffic that's coming in from your brain, okay, that's just going to keep it coming, okay. Uh, the only way to shut that off, to take those captive, but this is the, this the only way to truly take those thoughts captive is to ignore them, and refocus your conscious self on Christ, the Holy Spirit, and so on, and let Him deal with those thoughts, okay. You can't force those to go away. That, that, is, that is the opposite of what's going to be productive. Now, I know we think, well, I, I, that's a bad thing. I need to get rid of it. Okay. The point is the way your brains are structured. If you try to keep 
pushing thoughts out of your conscious mind, they're just going to keep rebounding and coming back stronger. Okay? So the ultimate strategy is learning to live with the uncomfortable presence of those. And that's what we'll talk about in two weeks. How do we do that? Okay, that, that's easier said than done. Uh, but that's going to be the solution. And speak to your thoughts. Uh, these are some things that you can say just as examples. Uh, I am not my thoughts. That is just a thought. It's not true. That's just a memory. It's not accurate. I'm not defined by the thoughts of others. That's another whole dynamic we can get into in another course is think about the thoughts that people are speaking to you and the way you're accepting them the same way you're accepting as involuntary thoughts. Okay. Uh, and think about this. When you're having an argument with someone like your spouse or something, are there things that they're saying to you coming from their active minds or their involuntary minds? Or the things that you say to others when you're upset, or, or is that coming from your active mind or your involuntary mind? I'll, okay, I'll let you think about that. So, My feelings are like weather. They will change. I will eventually feel different. That's especially true for like depression. Uh, I shall not be afraid what can man do to me. Uh, a great passage out of Psalms. Why are you uh, cast down on my soul? Uh, and so on. Uh, here's another great quote by Martin Lloyd-Jones talking about Psalms 42 and 43. That's a great, uh, this, this afternoon, go back. In fact, in your handout, I gave you a breakdown of Psalms 42 and 43. There's this dialogue that the psalmist is having with all these different chairs in his head. Okay, uh, And so Martin Lloyd-Jones talks about, here's an example where the psalmist starts talking back to his involuntary or negative thoughts. Uh, and he, at the very end, he says, you do all that. And he says, then defy yourself, defy other people, defy the devil and the whole world, and say with them, this man, I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, who is the wealth of my countenance and my God. So if you look in Psalms 42 and 43, you really see all, all four of these cheers operative as well as uh, the, the operation of the Holy Spirit. So uh, I've got a couple of quotes from that passage, examples of someone speaking out of that chair. Uh, and then we have the observing self says, why are thy, thy cast down on my soul? In other words, he stepped back and he's evaluating, what am I doing here? Why am I talking this way, thinking this way? Uh, and then there's just examples where the Holy Spirit, as he's in the observing chair, is speaking to him, saying, hope in God, I shall praise him. My, my salvation and my God. So we have truth now speaking into this person that can propagate back to these other chairs. That's another little example you can go through and look at how the psalmist broke that down. And I've laid that out for you in your handouts. And then finally, defy your thoughts and act on the truth. Uh, we're told to prepare our minds for action, okay? Because we have a battle going on inside of us for sure. Uh, and Jesus talks about the fact we need to take the truth and then we need to act upon that. Okay, so we'll look a lot more of that next week. Uh, here's another metaphor that might be useful. So uh, you might think of uh, anxiety, depression can be like you're out lost in the ocean and, and you feel like you're going to drown. Uh, again, by way of metaphor, your thoughts are like the waves that are coming by. Your mind is the ocean and yourself is a swimmer. You're kind of caught up in that. Right? You are not the waves. The waves are something that are happening to you. And so through God's word, we can hold on to his promises to keep us afloat. Uh, and then ultimately, as, as we start acting upon his word, uh, you might use this analogy, we can start surfing. And as the winds of adversity come uh, upon us, all right, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. So we have these three Three steps, floundering, floating, and focusing is sort of a progression that we can learn to go through as we start putting into, into uh, practice these principles we've talked about. And we start thinking about keeping our focus on, on Jesus, the very familiar passage in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. We're told we're surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, lay aside every weight. And I think those are things like disturbing thoughts or uncomfortable feelings. And we keep our eye on Jesus okay, who went through the same thing. Do you, do you realize Jesus had much more anxiety and depression than you did experientially, at least feeling? Okay, so when, you, when you're feeling overwhelmed, recognize Christ knows what you're going through. Okay, 
I mentioned that in one of the devotions this week. Think of the example of Peter. What do we know about this story with Peter? Remember, uh, Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter goes out. He calls Peter. He goes out on the boat, or out of the water, rather, walks to him. And then he gets almost there. He says he saw the waves or the wind, and he, he started to sink. Okay. What's, what's interesting about this story in the context of, say, anxiety? What, what's fascinating about it? Okay, that's a good point. So a lot of people think of Peter as a failure here. Right? Well, he took his eyes off. You know, it's his fault. It's his problem. Did Jesus stop the storm so Peter could walk out on the calm water? No, he didn't. Isn't that fascinating? Where was Jesus? He was out in the storm. Okay? So when you think about the storm of our lives, like anxiety or depression that you're, storm, you're starting with, recognize Jesus, in Peter's case, did not stop that. Peter had to get and walk through that to get where <laughs> Jesus was. So Jesus was out there in the storm waiting for him. So sometimes the storms that come in our life, we need to recognize Jesus can actually be in the storm, and that's where we can actually meet Jesus is in the storm. Okay? Uh, so, you know, Peter was the one that took the step, acted on his faith, and got out. All the other disciples didn't do that. And then when he got out there, when he got out there, Jesus said, basically, you know, why did you doubt me? Okay, a lot of people look at what Jesus said as sort of a, a rebuke to Peter. I think it's just actually the opposite. Okay, I think the context here was Jesus saying, Peter, I have you. Don't worry about it. Don't you recognize you'd be okay? Right? He was reassuring him. He was not condemning him. Okay, uh, let me give you a quote that I think I've sent out to you before. I love this. It says, God tells us not to be afraid because he knows we will. God knows that life is difficult and the world will be a scary place. He also knows that our minds will be assailed by scary and distressing thoughts. Example, the wind beyond our control. His command to fear not is not an indictment of our sin or lack of faith, but a promise that he will be with us. If we make God's promise into a judgment to avoid, then we make our peace dependent upon ourselves and not his grace and power. The command to fear not is a command to rest in the promises of God, not a command to try to generate our best courage and ignore our need for him. So, you know, a lot of times we think about Peter, I, you know, I feel like Peter, I'm a failure. I think just the opposite is true, okay? Jesus is in the storm. He's there waiting for you, and he's not there to condemn you. He's there to rescue you, okay, as we step out in faith and trust him. Now, do you think that was discomforting for Peter to get out and start walking on the water? Sure. So there's also another concept that we'll look at, like I said, in two weeks. There is a discomfort that comes about and stepping out on the boat and walking towards Jesus. Your anxiety, if you're doing the anxiety, your anxiety may get worse, okay? God doesn't, anxiety is not, is not mean that, that somehow God is not there, okay? God works in anxiety. You look at all the situations that I gave you in that little list of all these, all these situations that God allowed people to go through, okay? Because ultimately, he was using it to sanctify them and to make them more like him. Okay? Uh, it gives a new perspective on that. Uh, another, I'll finish with one reference to another analogy. One of my favorite movies is World War Z. Has anybody seen this? It's about zombies. It's one of the best metaphors for anxiety I've ever come across. Okay? Uh, I'll try to give you a real quick recap and no real light. So in this movie... Uh, the zombies are taking over the world. Uh, Brad Pitt is a scientist. He's gone all over the world trying to come up with the cure. And he comes up with a hypothesis that if the zombies avoid people that have terminal illness, they just don't touch them. They're like immune. They don't see them. So he comes up with this hypothesis that if he uh, injects himself with a toxin, that he will be immune to the zombies. 
So he goes to this facility uh, to try to get some toxins, but the facility has been taken over by the zombies. So he manages to get into this inner sanctum where all the drugs are, and his plan is to take these back out, but as he's getting ready to leave, this zombie shows up here uh, at the door. So he's trapped, okay? So now he has to make a decision. What is he going to do? Uh, there's all these drugs in here, but he doesn't know which ones are which. So in an act of faith, he injects himself with this toxin that could kill him, but it's certainly going to make him uh, have some fatal disease, right? unless he gets an antidote. Uh, and so then he makes the uh, momentous decision. He opens the door and lets this zombie in with him. Okay. And uh, there's all these other people watching from these video cameras for this extra drama to see what's going to happen. Uh, and then the, the zombie kind of smells him, and then he just kind of walks right by him, doesn't touch him. So then, then uh, Pitt leaves out to go through this um, causeway on the way. He gets a Coke or a drink, and he makes it dump all these, these drinks out, which uh, wakes up all the zombies. And so he's going down this corridor, and they all come running towards him, but they run right past him, okay? Uh, and th for me, this is a perfect example of, of as Christians, we, as we die to self, our identity now becomes hidden in Christ. And as we're hidden in Christ, there's really nothing that can affect us, all right? These zombies are like our thoughts that are attacking us. We're scared of them, but they can't do anything to you. They're powerless, Okay, if we recognize our identity in Christ, we're, we're totally powerless for that. And so at the end, he's walking through here. And I love this passage, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ and God. So as we, as, we, as we struggle with anxiety and depression, especially if we're struggling with our thought life, we have to recognize those crazy thoughts that you're struggling with are like these zombies. But you're, you're, you're now hidden in Christ. Okay, they can't touch you. Okay. They can scare you. Yes, it's very scary, all right? But we need to learn to face those and walk down the corridor, trust God and God's promises. They can't bother you. They can't get you because you're safe in me, okay? So I leave that with you. If you haven't seen the movie, it's a pretty good movie, especially that, that last scene. It's, just a, it, it's very anxiety-provoking, though, but, so, but uh, it's a way to kind of face some of those fears, Okay? All right, so I threw a lot at you. Hopefully, uh, this will give you something to think about this week and uh, some really good essays. I, I really encourage you to read through those and uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. So let's go ahead and close. Dear God, just thank you for our time together. Thank you for the promise that we have in your word that you're always with us, God. You'll never leave us. Uh, Lord, help us to recognize that we have freedom in you, uh, that we are hidden in you and our identity in Christ. Uh, God, and that the, the problems of anxiety and depression that we have, Lord, uh, in many cases are just things that we're allowing to attack us that we can be free of. So, Lord, help us to just uh, trust you and step out in faith. Uh, and, Lord, confront those as we rest in your word. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.